What's up, guys? I am super excited for today's podcast episode with my personal bookkeeper and my personal certified financial planner, Sheila and Megan. Welcome to the Green Industry Podcast. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. We talk all the time around here about knowing your numbers and that our numbers tell a story. Y'all know my story and uh, looking into my books and you guys are the best, but we're going to actually talk about what that means today to know your numbers and, and dive into the nitty gritty. So I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, just to appease Sheila's legalities, she's a certified <laughs> financial planner, not an attorney, not a, you know, your, your uncle that knows everything about life, right? At Chris, he's, he's in jail, but he's, he's a, he's an expert on world affairs. <laughs> you go over the legalities. So you're not a, a CPA. You're not an attorney. You are a CFP, a certified financial planner. That is correct. And Megan, you are my personal yeah. bookkeeper. Personal bookkeeper and certainly not any of those. I'm probably <laughs> going to learn just as much as the audience today. And so as you hear me think through it, please don't take this as advice. We are hoping to have conversations surrounding some maybe common questions or tax thoughts, but yep. I'm not here to give any sort of legal advice or tax advice. Okay. Well, we will dive right into it. The biggest challenge we face, Sheila, in our industry right now is the rising cost and inflation and guys are concerned and how do we run our business keep current with our taxes with everything that's going on so i'm going to let you kind of take it away and, and share any of your thoughts from your perspective on uh, what we can do we've talked about this paul and i've talked about it with megan a lot i think the best thing that you can do is work with a team you really have to you know i i don't want to beat a dead horse so to speak but you need to really drill down on what your expenses are in order to know how to run your business better. Having a, a good set of books is a great start. And also, I think knowing what advice is out there that applies to you is probably my biggest thought for the day is I think there's a lot of great advice that is thrown out on, you know, just in public forums that don't necessarily apply to your business and you. And that's why it's, um, you know, it's kind of important to have a conversation at least with an attorney, with an accountant, with a bookkeeper to know exactly what rules apply to your business. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. I want to ask this question to both of you because it's really, really cool here at the Green Street Podcast. We're getting so many folks that are new in this business or they're going to be going full-time. I just had a guy, Gibson from Mississippi, Gibson's Lawn Care. He's going full-time next April. He's leaving his job at the shipyard. He's going to do this full-time. And so <laughs> lots of guys that are listening are in that first year, consider right. going in that first year, maybe even that second year. So what's one piece of practical advice you would give to somebody who just started out or is starting out? And I wish you would have told me this 12 years ago because I, I did just about everything wrong that I could have. But go ahead and share one piece of practical advice for the guys just starting out. Let's see. I think the best advice for someone who's new is understand the impact from a, a tax perspective. What's going to change in your in your world? Mm. Because going from having a W-2 to having a good set of books on your from your own business is a way different tax liability issue. You know, a W-2 employee, which obviously your friend has been, is going to have someone else taking out those taxes. So when you look at having a gross income and then you take your expenses out and that's how you arrive at the figure that's going to go to your W or to your 1040, and that 1040 is going to not only produce a figure for you to pay for that income tax, but you're also going to be adding in another, you know, 15.3% for your self-employment tax. And that's just not something that most people are familiar with unless you've owned your own business before. So that's probably the biggest shock. So understand the impact of that. And the best way to handle that in the future after that first year in business is to pay estimated taxes. Can you elaborate on the estimated quarterly tax payments and how important that is and, and how guys pay those on time? Okay, so, so the best way to, to pay your quarterly taxes, well, first of all, after your first official filing as a business owner, which is most likely going to be as a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, you will file that. You normally would on a 1040. You're just going to add a Schedule C to your return. 
So after that first year of business, you'll have a pretty good idea of what your, your profits were. And the profits are what's going to drive the self-employment tax. So that profit figure is what you're going to use to calculate your estimated tax payments. And then you actually start on the same day that you pay your taxes. So you start on April 15th of every year, and then you pay quarterly. And the last payment is actually not in December. It's in January. I guess for some reason, the IRS decided that everybody gets a Christmas break. So, so yes, you will have your payments due in April and June, no, July, September, and then January. So April, June, September, and then January. Fantastic. And if you don't pay those on time, you get penalties and interest. So, pay, pay uh, well. Yeah, yes, yes, that, that is correct. Um, I just think, you know, I think from a business owner's perspective, especially when you're first starting out, it's so much better to do it quarterly anyway. You just, I mean, you feel better about things. And it's not a really ugly conversation with somebody like me, your tax preparer, whenever we're having that conversation in March or April, because you don't right. want to have to tell. And like I said, you have to start the estimated tax payments in April. So theoretically, you want to you want to be done with it in January. That's good. So that you can start all over again in April. But we got Megan back now. Just uh -huh. so you, no, it's okay. Those microphones, if you're not like kissing it, it sounds horrific so i moved it to the <laughs> actual webcam so hopefully it's a little yeah bit that sounds way better sounds good okay yeah i think i was just coming in right when sheila was saying the practical piece of wisdom would be to recognize and help and have somebody help you recognize the difference between your w-2 liabilities to the irs and what it may be to have a you know 1040 as a business owner and the difference between that which led into the, another practical piece of advice, which is to pay estimated quarterly taxes. Keep that top of mind every quarter, you know, have that cash flow out of your business within that quarter rather than waiting till the year end and having all of that come your way all at once. And of course the IRS wants it, you know, they're not just good. sit by and <laughs> smile. It's not a suggestion. That's very interesting for you guys listening we didn't script this. Like I said, I'm going to ask you this question and you say this answer, but on my top priority of, of what I wanted to talk about today was quarterly tax payments. And you guys both seem to simultaneously agree that if you're just getting started out, probably the most important thing you can do in your business is get into that routine, get into that rhythm right out of the gate. And again, nobody explained this to me, Sheila and Megan. And I, I had no idea. I was at W2 like, right. what? You know, and I find that true of a lot of my customers as well, my clientele, which tend to be within that first five years of business. And I'll say something like quarterly estimated taxes, and they'll be like, wait, what is that? And I don't know where the lapse is. I don't know if it's just a matter of no one hands anybody a business packet, or perhaps it just goes back to the idea of, you know, you're new in business and it is the entrepreneurial spirit to put yourself out there and just to figure it out and find it out. And part of that would be, as Sheila said, searching out those tax answers, getting some people on your team who can help you answer and know what best practices would be. Mm -hmm. That's good. I want to talk about the, the team because I didn't have a team right out of the gate. It was me, myself, and I, and I made so many financial decisions. It's, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What are the most misconceptions that the folks have when they do think about a team and getting a bookkeeper and a, a certified financial planner and and building those people on the team kind of share some misconceptions about why people are so reluctant and hesitant to build a team early on. I think it's probably financial. I yeah. think, I think that most business owners, I mean, and Megan and I are both business owners. We've made our own missteps along the way. I certainly have myself. It's hard to know when you don't know. <laughs> if you don't know that you don't know that you need to pay estimated taxes, it's hard to know. I know there's a lot of of your listeners that are in that that bridge where they're they're going from w-2s to to even maybe 1099s from you know being subcontractors i would say don't be hesitant to ask the question because yes. it might not be as expensive as you think it's going to be right you might find out that no you don't need us on um, all the time 
I like the fact that, that Megan has monthly touches with her clients. Most of them don't want to talk to me <laughs> unless it's quarterly because I, you know, I have a gazillion years of experience doing taxes and, and working with small business owners to make sure that they're achieving their goals. But it's, it's really helpful for me to have a client that's working with Megan and Joey because I'm working with clean books. I'm working with good numbers. And as, if I'm working with good numbers, I can give you good advice. I can really help guide you towards where you're telling me you want to go. Right. And I do think that might be one of the common misconceptions is that, oh, well, CPAs do bookkeeping. And it's true. And yet <laughs> there is a functional difference between what me claiming to be a bookkeeper does mm -hmm. and what someone like Sheila or, you know, other CPAs and tax repairs out there are doing as a tax preparer. And so what a tax preparer is doing in the realm of bookkeeping is getting it ready for a Schedule C. And yet as your bookkeeper, you know, obviously I know there's an end in sight and a necessary tax world there that the bookkeeping does plug into. But as a bookkeeper, I'm not just solely basing everything in your books off a of Schedule C and what, you know, what expenses are going there. My goal as your bookkeeper is really to function as, you know, that day to day transactions, day to day bank account questions which, you know, seems simple, but if you just need somebody to ask because many times you're too busy and you don't know the answers or what, what might guide you. So I think the common misconception would be that, well, CPAs do the bookkeeping. And there really is a functional difference between a tax preparer's bookkeeping and perhaps, I don't know any other word for it, but just what I would do as a bookkeeper. And like Sheila said, the benefit would be as a tax preparer, she now has somebody who you know, she can trust to have the books clean. Of course, she has that relationship and partnership to be able to ask you questions if something seems awry or she just needs to know more information for her own set of functions within the tax world and the liabilities. Yeah. And you guys are my one-two punch. So personally, guys, this is what I personally do is I, Megan and her husband, Joey, they keep my books squeaky clean. They, they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, Megan will annoy you like Amazon, $6.17. <laughs> Paul, six dollars and seventeen cents at Amazon. What did you get? I don't know. I got to go into Amazon, look in the work or, or order history. Oh, I bought a cable adapter, Megan. Cable adapter. That's what that six dollars and seventeen cents. But I mean, she's got everything organized, squeaky, squeaky clean. And then once a month, Megan and Joey and myself, we we get on a, a call. And Neil shows up sometimes. Their <laughs> their baby, and they look at my numbers. They they explain to me. The statement of cash flows, they explained to me the balance sheet and what these numbers are saying. Of course, the profit and loss statement. And the more reps we get in, the more confident I, I'm starting to, to notice these numbers. And then they give me guidelines and parameters like, hey, let's shoot for always trying to get this X amount of revenue in your business. That's going to pay your owner's pay, which we're going to get to next, owner's pay and paying your employees. And then, you know, all of the expenses you have in your business. And let, let's try to keep the expenses under this because- I want to go out and buy all kind of new shiny equipment like everyone else does. That's great. But if we know, okay, I can only spend X amount each month extra on that stuff. Then I, I kind of have to have the self-control to wait till next month to buy this and maybe the next month of that. And it gives me more, more motivation to go out and make more revenue. Cause if I can bring in more bacon, then maybe I can expedite the schedule. But anyway, and from there, those are 12. Go, go ahead, Megan. I was just going to say, and just that that idea of a team member. I know many of your audience knows me and Joey and a little bit of our past really well, but they may not know exactly where Sheila's coming from and what she truly does add to this team of a, not only a bookkeeper, but also a certified financial planner. So I don't know if you don't mind, Sheila, but could you go into a little bit of past experience and what led you has led you to this point? Well, I have been in the tax world since 1994. Yes, I'm that old. Um, and now I shifted, as I said earlier, I've made some missteps in, in my career as well. I have been in the tax world, though, consistently since 1994. I became a financial planner about 20 years ago. I actually became certified in 2010 somewhere along the lines, 2012, somewhere along that line. Anyway, I, you know, it's just for me, there's, there's been a very distinct path that I didn't prescribe for myself. 
life took me down this path, but I, but I've enjoyed working with individuals, but I found my passion in working with business owners, small business owners. And I, you know, up to about a medium sized business owner, 50 employees is pretty much where I would define a medium business owner, 50 to 75. There's so many questions about when do I add new employees? When do I add a, a benefits plan? When do I become just the owner and just the manager? And how can I do that? And how can I still save for retirement or maybe put some money into my child's education plan? So having experience as both a financial planner and as a tax preparer, I've just found this really great place that I like to be when I'm with clients um, as a consultant for a small business owner, because I can handle and really do love answering those questions and helping them figure it out and creating the plan. Because going back to what you asked earlier, Paul, the biggest advice or the biggest piece of advice I think a business owner needs to hear is have a plan. Mm -hmm have a plan. You know, if, if you don't think that you, you really need somebody like Megan and Joey or me yet, that's fine, but create a plan, sure. have goals, have your steps laid out. And whenever you don't see that you're holding yourself accountable, or you see that you don't exactly know how to get those, those things done on your plan, that's when you start bringing in people who know a little bit or have a different skill set. I won't say they know more because you certainly know more than I do about, you know, aspects of your industry. But I would say just have a plan and find the right team to support your plan when you don't when you don't feel like it's going that well. You're mm -hmm. trying to goals. certainly reiterate that. And, you know, not to get too off the course, but there's no positive emotion unless you're moving towards something that it. And I don't want to say no as some absolute, but just think about, it. you know, our, our brains are wired. If you're advancing positive emotion, if there's obstacles away, negative emotion. And so if you're just sort of wandering out there, you were 16, your dad said, get out there, do some work. But now you're finding yourself really transitioning into, oh, this could, you know, this is a service that truly can make money. I kind of like the business side of this. But then you just sort of do things and you listen. It, it's so important, as Sheila is saying, to sit down and plan it. And just like Sheila said, it doesn't require anybody on your team to begin with. But give yourself concrete goals that are measurable because what gets measured gets managed. And then give yourself, you know, bring into reality what it is you think business can do for you, not just stating all the things business will and might do for you. And that's something Sheila can really help with, which, you know, leads me to a, maybe another common misconception, Paul. And that is, I think in the beginning, a lot of this sort of triad between lawyers and certified or tax preparers, she living tax preparers and bookkeepers, we all tend to kind of point fingers at the other person. And, you know, it's, it's almost as if there is a fine line between what we do functionally, but where people get their information isn't always, there's not as a fine line there. And so I knew pretty soon going into bookkeeping, I did not want to touch that tax world. It's ever changing. It's left to somebody else's skill set and knowledge. And so there is once again a functional difference, but even as it's coming clear in our conversation, I'm much more the organization, the first line of defense, and she can help you with that, that big picture of planning and strategizing and fine tuning, I think would be a good word for what it is she's able to bring to the table other than what a bookkeeper is doing month to month. Can we elaborate a little bit on owner's pay and paying employees? I think that's a big issue as I do coaching mm -hmm. with guys. I'll use my buddy Luke for, as an example, he's out in Sacramento. He's a you know young kid, has a business and it's booming, it's growing. Now he needs to bring on a full-time employee to help him execute all these services. What does he do? How, how should Luke, we'll use him as an, our, our example, Sacramento, California, shout out to Luke, friend of the show. How does he pay himself as the owner? Then how does he pay his first employee? We're talking the right way. I'm not talking about going to the ATM and getting a wad of cash. And yeah. How does Luke pay his employee appropriately in himself and, and get all that set up? Megan, you want me to go first on this one? Most definitely. Okay. So Paul, I hate to be that it depends kind of person, but it depends. I don't know Luke's structure. And that's why, you know, I, like I said, um, you know, you have to use the disclaimers of 
this isn't going to fit for everybody, but let's say Luke is a, a sole proprietor or a single member LLC filing as a sole proprietor, then he would just be taking owner's draws. And whatever he takes out of the business, of course, is going to be part of that owner's draw. But you have to think about the way that information flows on, you know, for the for the tax purposes, for income tax purposes, you know, he's going to be taxed on anything that's not considered an expense for his business. So the profit, the net profit from the business is what he's going to be taxed on. It doesn't really matter how much he writes a check for every month to himself. He's still going to pay taxes on the, on the total net profit. Now, as far as hiring an employee, of course, you first want to check with the state. I'm speaking from a federal perspective, but I would highly recommend putting someone on payroll unless you do not feel like that person is going to be a part of your business then you might want to treat them as a subcontractor or if you you know if they're coming and bringing their own equipment and they're doing the job and then they're leaving and you don't have any control over them then you might be able to hire them as a subcontractor but you know that's not truly an employee and i want to give a quick plug sheila on our podcast cover art we have in the bottom left hand, uh, right hand corner, left hand corner. Depends how you look at it. left hand corner. I guess <laughs> it's Some it corner. says it says roll by ADP, and ADP they're the I believe the largest payroll company in America. I think one out of six paychecks ACHs I guess nowadays mm -hmm. come from ADP, and they've recently created an app that makes payroll as easy as one two three. I mean you you literally get in there, type in your information, type in your new employee's information. And it knows what city, state, you yep. know, country you're in. And it's going to get everything above board done accurately. Then all you got to do is type in, you know, um, Jose worked 32 hours at $18 an hour. And then it will, it will pull all the ta pro appropriate taxes and, and then pay Jose. And so it's super, super convenient. It's called Roll by ADP. You guys can check the show note links. Mm -hmm. You want to get started for payroll. It wasn't this easy back when I started my business. And I think that was one of the reasons why I was so confused about all this, but literally ADP will take the guesswork out of you. If you, if you can type in their name and basic information, mm -hmm. ADP does all the difficult legalities and, and yes. um, they know the difference between California versus Georgia or mm -hmm. South Carolina versus Florida. They have all that. They already have all that figured mm -hmm. out. Cause it's all, I, I know you gave the, it depends answer. But it, they already have all that worked out. So anyway, they do. Uh, there's just great payroll, great payroll services out there. And and you know, if you're working with a bookkeeper, uh, Megan can help you link that to your books so that you're getting the you know that information would be automatically going into say your QuickBooks Online account. But definitely use all the resources of either your bookkeeper or your payroll provider because you want to you know from a a record keeping standpoint, there are quarterly taxes that are quarterly tax reports. Most people are, are actually paying those taxes on a biweekly or monthly basis, depending on the size of your company. But you have, you know, some, some reporting that you have to do on the federal level and at the state level. You need to make sure that you understand what your workman's comp responsibilities are for your state. So, you know, there's a lot and those resources are available through those payroll providers and they give you the W-2 uh, information. They'll give you the information to collect for your 1099s if you do have any contract employees because you, you want to make sure that any time that you are paying somebody to work in your business, that you have at least uh, a W-9 and in most states an I-9 is a good, is, you know, is a good rule of thumb as well. Um, and I, uh, you know, and you also want to have your, uh, your W-4s for any employees. Which, you know, just to add to that, I think probably a general rule we could, you know, come to out of that is keep those forms inside your truck you know, have, have those on hand. What she said was, you know, W, W9, is that right, Sheila? W9 is going to be for somebody that you would consider a, a contractor, a subcontractor, or, you know, a, a gig worker of sorts, day laborer. And then uh, your W4 is going to be for an employee. 
Paul, just to mention, I had a client come on who uses Roll, and it's it's an interesting system because it's as if you're chatting with a bot, but they know everything. <laughs> you know, I mean, they know it all. They know the state. They know they know everything, and yeah. it, it does really go back to my point earlier of just that separation of skills. I had I don't even do payroll. There was you know two things clearly that were outside my realm of expertise and skill, and that was payroll and taxes. And so I would say anybody who, you know, is looking at bringing on some employees and starting to get into crews, needing some labor, then look into a some sort of payroll provider. They are completely worth the, the payment made to them and all the record keeping they do for you. I, I think right now it's, well, first of all, you get your first three months free with clicking on the Roll by ADP link. So Everyone okay. should try them out for free for three months. And I think it's like 29 bucks a month after that. I mean, it's unreal. I, it's like it, I'm talking to Roberto. I was like, why didn't you guys have this? It's, not my it's really, really affordable these days, a lot more affordable. And uh, it's so valuable. I mean, aside, aside from estimated taxes, payroll taxes and sales tax are the two other kind of hot buttons for, because a lot of uh, small business owners don't realize what their responsibilities are. And that, that, especially for sales tax, if you don't know, contact your secretary of state and make sure that you are operating within what the, the rules are for your state. 